If you're anything like me, you love studying deep concepts, but there's a dissonance. You feel like you could never be as deep as your favorite authors, speakers, or even just the people you follow on social media. As an 18 year old that just got arrested for smoking pot in the college parking garage, I gave the book, The Power of Now, a try. I read the book very closely. I practiced the meditations and I opened my mind to the possibility of a higher power that I had closed my mind off to when I was a rebellious young teen who was being forced to go to church. That book, The Power of Now, changed everything for me. It eased my worries about getting a potential felony charge when I got arrested, and it helped me calm down and be a lot less reactive towards the things I didn't agree with as a teenager. I didn't remember everything from that book, but I remembered 10 times more than I did from other books that I was either told to read or was just reading because I felt like reading, um, I retained a lot more knowledge. So that's what we're here to talk about is why I retained so much more knowledge. And now I know that in my videos, I usually drag on the intro quite a bit. So with this one, I want to start with some actionable advice that you can take, but the deeper stuff, we need to build up to it so that you can understand it. So let's dive into some takeaways from the start. But if you want like the depth and something that you can practice in your everyday life, stick around for the rest of the video. So why did I remember so much from that book? From my self-reflection, I came up with three steps. The first one was having an intention. I'm very big on goal setting, whether you are aware of that goal or not, or whether you keep it at the top of mind or not, you need something to aim towards. And when I read the book, it was the perfect fit for my situation in life. I was at arguably one of the lowest points in my life. I mean, imagine getting arrested as an 18 year old, going home for college, getting a letter in the mail saying that you, have, you either have to go to court and possibly be convicted uh, of a felony, or you pay like $10,000 and have to get tested every single week for drugs and just pee in a cup every week at a random time. And so clearly this freaked me out. I didn't have any money to my name. I was the stereotypical broke college student who was working a summer job just to be able to have some money to pay for college and the things I was doing during that time for when I went back to college the next year. And there was just no way in hell that I was gonna tell my parents about what happened. So trying to keep that a secret just stress me out even more. And so when The Power of Now, the book was recommended to me, I had the intent. I was in that perfect place in life where the teaching stood out to me, where I had something practical to try and overcome the challenges that I was facing mentally. So this led to me reading that book, which I have heard from many people that have talked to me after I recommend that book, where they say it's maybe too woo woo or too spiritual or they just didn't understand it. And the reason why is because they're not in the situation in life where the teachings will register in their awareness in order for them to actually change their behavior to get the desired outcome that they want to get. That was the first thing is having an intention. The second thing is genuine curiosity. I first heard about the book, The Power of Now from Matt Ogus. And um, if you guys were around like a decade ago, on YouTube and were into fitness, there were a few select like OG fitness YouTubers. Uh, Matt Ogus was one of them and he was just someone that I continuously watched, right? He got me in the gym. Uh, I just loved his personality. He was someone that I aspired to be like and I trusted him. And so he had recommended that book many times, but I had yet to uh, like dive into the whole spirituality thing. And so when I finally decided to pick it up, I was genuinely curious to go through the book and figure out what this whole spirituality thing that people are talking about is. And so genuine curiosity in this case with having an intention made me read that much more close. I wanted to understand it, right? I wasn't looking to close my mind off and pick apart little things that I don't agree with in the book. I wanted to understand what was going on there, even though my mind did react. Like when he talked about God in the actual book, I'm like, oh, God doesn't exist. And, but then I had to step back and be like, okay, but does, does he actually, or does the notion of God, is there something that I'm missing here that I wouldn't otherwise discover if I just wrote the notion of God off entirely? So the third thing is reducing the execution gap. 
The greatest skill one can develop is decreasing the time between idea and execution. That is a tweet that I wrote that just popped off randomly. Uh, it was very apparent at my point in life, as many of my tweets are, some people disagreed with it. Like, oh, there's different skills that are the greatest skill. And it's like, yeah, I understand. But in my situation in life, that was the greatest skill. So when I read the book and I came across something that I could practice, I didn't keep reading, right? I stopped, I put down the book and I practiced, whether it be when I was outside drinking my coffee, I read it and it gave advice about meditation, I would stop right there and meditate. And so since the ideas and everything else had aligned to the point where I would notice whether or not the practices were working, right? Since all of that was at the top of my mind and I hadn't forgot any of it, I hadn't forgot any of the nuances that would make me glance over the outcome that I was trying to achieve, it was that much easier to solidify that knowledge and practice in my head because I had backed it with direct experience. That is an important point. I backed the theory with direct experience. So having an intention, genuine curiosity, and reducing the execution gap is a great way to retain a lot of what you learn, but we can do better than that. Over the years, here's what I've discovered to 10x what I learn and retain much of what I learned, so much so that as an example, I can articulate things in the form of a YouTube video here. The modern problem is abundance of information. We love to hoard theory, orthodoxy, and conceptual understanding of things without the direct experience to back them. Life doesn't work that way, and we all know those guys in either the Instagram comments or just the comments somewhere where they'll just write like a book's worth of information, let's say on like fitness, but then you go and you look at their profile and it doesn't look like they've ever stepped within 10 feet of a barbell. And it's the same with business. It's like, you'll see someone give a book of business advice, but then you actually look at their business and it doesn't look like they've been within a 10 foot radius of a customer. And what you'll find in most domains is that the true experts rarely need guidance. They use the science theory advice and then backed it with action to get to the intermediate stage. But then after that, in the expert stage, it's usually based off of intuition because you have such a solid understanding of the entire domain that you know what to do next. So the main question here is how do we balance practice with theory? And that is by becoming a builder, always having something to build or always having a project in alignment with the thing that you are learning. So when I was first learning Photoshop, as an example, I would just watch YouTube videos all the time. I didn't practice Photoshop. I didn't even have the app downloaded. And that of course led to nowhere. When I downloaded the app and tried to test my knowledge by creating some form of design, I wasn't able to create anything. I had to supplement with learning anyways. And so once I realized this and understood how much knowledge I actually retained by having a project to build out first or having an intention and then supplementing that with either specific tutorials or just trying to find the specific knowledge that I needed when I encountered a problem or when I didn't know how to do something, that's when it locked into my brain. And so going on to that, when I started web design and I wanted to build a website, I knew that I just had to just, I had to start fooling around with the software and trying to build something. And then when I didn't know how to do something like create a specific navigation design, then I go and look that up specifically and then work through it with the tutorial. And then I could almost replicate that every single time after with any other website I created. Now, why does this method of always having something to build works so well when it comes to retaining knowledge. So the first thing is forced synchronicity because novelty, pattern recognition, and dopamine are crucial for learning. That's how you kind of get into learning. When you make that discovery, dopamine, excitement, from noticing patterns or noticing how you can use one thing in another area, that's when your brain is kind of just ready to understand that. And as an example, when our ancestors learn something new, especially when it aligned with their survival, that's when it kind of became very apparent to them that they had to retain that knowledge. So when one of our ancestors or someone in the old times would go by a bush over and over again, right? It was conditioned into their brain that the bush didn't really aid in their survival. There was no fruit, there was no berries, whatever it may be, it was just a bush. But when they noticed something new, like berries growing on the bush, that caught their attention and they 
were much more likely to remember that the next time come around if they needed it for their survival because now it had berries. But if they didn't have anything to use those berries for, like if they weren't berries and it was just a new leaf, then they wouldn't remember it because they didn't have anything to apply it to. And so in that case, they were using the berries for their physical survival. But when you have a project, <laughs> and I've talked about this a few other times, but a lot of what we're trying to do in this modern age with information and ideas is we're trying to survive the notion or the concept of self, right? What we think we are, the idea of what we are, and that causes a lot of pain and suffering. But in this case, when you have a project that is meaningful, you will notice things in order to survive that project because you want that project to progress and develop and live. And so when that's in your awareness or when you know that something's there, you're going to notice things that align with that and that you can apply to that project in order for it to grow. So that was for synchronicity. But the second thing is the law of inspired action. I only write when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes at nine every morning. William Faulkner. Everyone knows that they can act better when they are inspired. Like if you're going to go train chest at the gym, you may watch a chest motivation video before you go or just a chest workout so you can get motivation for exercise and form that you can do while you're there so it's at the top of your mind. And before I write, I love reading authors and just ideas and writing that inspires me and gives me ideas. And so with a project, you are enticed to learn in accordance with it because it will inspire you to keep that project going. And so referring to the quote I just read from William Faulkner, if you have something that you can consume that will help with your project before you even work on the project or have some way of working that into your routine, you can see my video on my fill empty use framework for productivity and creativity to bake into your daily routine. That's only going to help and it's going to keep the momentum going with that project's growth. So as another example, if you are 100% committed to building a business, you are going to naturally gravitate if you aren't distracted. All of this is with the preface that you aren't distracted and you are actively eliminating distractions. But if you're committed to building a business, you're going to naturally gravitate towards consuming the information that will help you build that business. But you have to start building the damn business in order to apply those teachings. Now, the third thing is specific knowledge, which we've already touched on a bit. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know I am a big fan of the advice, start then learn. When you start something, even if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna encounter problems. These problems will induce struggle and prime your brain to learn. So you won't be learning blindly or without context or from somebody that isn't teaching you exactly what you're trying to do. Because when you learn blindly, you gain a bunch of information fat. It's like in bodybuilding when you do a dirty bulk versus a lean bulk. In a dirty bulk, you're gonna gain a lot more fat than you will muscle. And in a lean bulk, you're trying to optimize for those lean muscle gains, but you're of course going to pick up some extra body fat along the way. And so if you dirty bulk too hard or you learn so much that your thoughts are just scattered, you're going to feel slow, sluggish, tired until you get to the point where you just feel so bad that you're going to have to go into a cutting phase. You're going to have to ruthlessly eliminate a lot of the things that you learned because they have no practical application in your life. So start building something and then ask questions or seek specific advice in the form of advice or tutorials online when the problem comes up. Because anything other than that, from what I've seen, asking vague questions like, should I start, is just procrastination from starting. If you don't know what the result is going to be after you start, the only way you're going to know what it is is not from someone else. It's going to happen from you directly experiencing that result you get from starting. If you want to learn faster, don't start learning. Outline a project, start building it out, learn along the way. Too many people get trapped in tutorial hell, stacking up useless knowledge as brain fog. Start, encounter a problem, seek specific knowledge to overcome it. That is a tweet I wrote, and I think it's a pretty good summary if you just want to refer to that to kind of remember uh, what we just talked about. So let's take this up a notch because building helps you retain quite a bit of knowledge, but teaching helps you retain even more. Teaching is another modality where you can solidify that knowledge even further in your brain. So why don't we combine the two to create a life of novelty, synchronicity, and serendipity just to increase 
not only the amount of knowledge that we retain, but the enjoyment that we have for life as a whole by creating a lifestyle that is conducive to us learning the things that we want to learn, which is what we talk about in a lot of these videos, just under a different context. And so how do we do this? We do this by turning you into the project because building a project doesn't only apply to something external. It doesn't only apply to like a Photoshop project. If you treat your entire life as a project that you build and grow and cut down and rebuild and just have fun with along the way, then life becomes that much better because everything that you learn can be applied to your life. And so this implies holistic development because personal development doesn't only come from improving yourself. It comes from the impact that you make on the world, AKA what you teach other people. In other words, your business, or for those that don't resonate with the term business or think that they can't start a business or think that they aren't ready, you can exchange the word business for your life's work or your calling, or just however you plan to leave the world better than you left it. So it's the polarity between selfishness and selflessness, improving yourself and then helping others improve. It's like climbing a mountain, but carving out a trail along the way that other people can follow or documenting your journey so others can achieve it faster. And if enough people do this, imagine what we can achieve, right? Because people are getting to higher levels of consciousness and just personal growth and professional growth much, much faster. This is why I'm a huge proponent of the creator economy and creating your own product or service that helps other people get to where you're at faster because then Everyone is going, that's how you raise the collective consciousness is by helping people develop themselves faster by kind of finding out what the real shortcuts are by promoting a holistic understanding of things. And then what comes next, right? We don't know because we're going to hopefully raise a group of people to be these top performers. And then they're going to have the creative uh, ideas to take us into that next phase of life or business or all of the subdomains under those things. And this is what business is to me at least. And I feel like a lot of people mistake business as just some mega corporation that just hates everyone and isn't really conducive to society as a whole. So let's tie everything that we've learned here into six steps for how you can retain the most knowledge possible. So the first thing is set in intention. And that means set a goal create a purpose, have a why behind your actions or however you want to frame it. Make an intention to improve your life or to actualize your potential. This has to be held at the top of your awareness if you want to apply the things that you consume to how you can improve any facet of your life. So this sets your focus on the future and it allows you to channel everything that you experience into that vision. It allows you to see the side or view the things that you view from the lens of your vision. Therefore, you are only going to see them in that positive light. Of course, you can see them in a negative light and this is a lifelong process, but you get what I'm saying here. Everything you consume starts to fuel your vision if that vision is genuinely important and you are dedicated to achieving that. So step number two is to schedule a creativity block because Everyone and their mother knows that scheduling time for productivity or deep work is important. But what people don't understand is that productivity and creativity are on two sides of the same coin. You have to have creative things to implement through productivity, because if you're a creative and you're just trapped in this loop of like narrow focus, hyper productivity, what are you doing? Like, are you hunting for ideas outside of your productive work blocks? Or are you creating on an empty tank? Do you value the spontaneous nature of creativity? And do you have a balance between that? Or are you a slave to regimented work and productivity apps? So my favorite way to do this, and you can test and experiment for yourself on what works best for you. But my favorite way to do this is to just schedule a 30 minute walk. And on this walk, you can listen to an audiobook or podcast related to your intention, contemplate your future and let your mind work through problems, get yourself away from the distractions that would keep you in a non-creative state. And so if you don't know what the default mode network is in psychology, I would highly recommend you learn that, but it comes from shifting your focus from external to internal. And that's what kind of kicks on, uh, the thing in your brain that allows you to be more creative. It kind of opens and expands your mind to the point 
of having ideas uh, register in your conscious mind so that you can actually have access to them and write them down and then use them in your productive work sessions. And an example that I always use for this is like when a programmer encounters a bug when they're writing code, right? They encounter a problem. So when you're building out a project and you encounter a problem and you just can't figure out how to do it, then you need to take a break and go on a walk or just rest and do nothing or go to the gym or something that isn't focused on work. And then like magic, like when you're in the shower and have a shower thought, the idea or the solution comes to your mind and then you need to write it down and go back and implement it into your code or into your project. And so this is also important because a lot of people are living in a state of just narrow focus and that is when uh, stress becomes a thing, is when you're narrowly focused on a thing that causes stress. And so just having these things baked into your routine where you are encouraged to open your mind and get into the state of open focus and de-stress is just going to be helpful all around, not only for like creativity and work reasons. So step number three is to create a note taking system. So I could write an entire book on this, on taking notes. I'm actually creating a software right now for creators to uh, have a better way of taking notes for their creations. It's like steal like an artist, but in software form. But I also have a free seven day challenge, uh, creative challenge that has my current note taking system in it where you can download that link in the description. It's free, it has a full course inside of it. Um, that really changed my life and I feel like it will help quite a bit with your creative endeavors. And so the purpose of creating a note-taking system is because as you're going about this, with the intention of you improving your life as a project and even having creative projects or work projects to build out, you having those intentions, you're when you're away from those projects and not working on them and you're in that state of creativity, and the ideas are popping into your head, you need a place to write them down and possibly develop those ideas further so that your work in building out your projects, whether it's your life or your business, it will fuel it that much better. And the best way I can explain this example of like when you're out and about is when you notice a new car for the first time, one that you've never seen before, and then you're going down the road and you start to see them everywhere. So my editor, for example, when the Jeep Gladiator came out, uh, we both looked at it and we thought it was like the stupidest looking car. And so now we're plagued with that. And every time we see a Jeep Gladiator, Devin, the editor, he always goes, hey, a Jeep Gladiator. And I swear to God, he said that like 200 times by now. Devin, you really need to stop saying that. But at the same time, it helps paint a picture of what we're talking about here. And so imagine if you were in love with the idea of building out the project of your mind, body, spirit, and business, you would start to see opportunity everywhere. And if you don't have that intention, all of those opportunities are just slipping right under your nose. So step number four is to build every aspect of your life. You aren't seeing progress because you're obsessed with the polished end result, not the process that created it. You have to understand here that you are Building, building, right? How long does it take to build a mansion? Especially building a mansion by yourself, right? Building a mansion may take like a year or two with a construction team, but you don't have a construction team. You're only you. Building a mansion is going to take your entire lifetime. And that's exactly the point here is to fall in love with infinite games, not finite status games. So I've said this many times before, but really if you're just starting out, you have to try out everything and see what genuinely interests you. And then when you catch that whiff of excitement or dopamine that tries to pull you down the rabbit hole of discovery, then don't deny that. You have to go into it and see if you get obsessed with it. And then once you find that thing, you continue repeating that process for life. You get obsessed with one thing and that expands your awareness to in that domain. And then you notice another thing that you would have never normally noticed because you haven't tried or committed to anything. And then you commit to that, you go further down the rabbit hole, and this is just how you compound knowledge over time is by trying things, diving deep on one, living in that area, or experiencing life from that state of heightened knowledge, and then branching off into something else, going down that branch, and then another branch, and then another branch, and then coming back and like seeing the whole picture and just, that's it. If you don't make time to build, you are assigned time to build for someone else. So step five is to teach what you know. Now, we've talked about learning, building, uh, teaching this entire time. So here's a graphic as we always do. I like this one, it's very simple, but you can see on the 
outlines of the circles, that white line or that white part of the circle represents how much you can learn doing that thing. So when you start, you're going to learn so much more than just learning alone, right? And then when you start building, you're going to learn even more because you have something to apply what you are learning to, and you can encounter problems and speak, seek specific knowledge. And then when you teach, it just solidifies it that much better. And you're forced to articulate your understanding of it, right? And then you can identify where you have knowledge gaps in what you're trying to teach because you're, it's going to suck at first, right? I, my first YouTube video sucked. All of my teaching sucked, but I identified what sucked about it. And then I was able to fill in those blanks, come back to it and start reteaching it from better place. And so this whole teaching thing, it's known as the protege effect. In short, that means learning by teaching. And so clearly, as I keep talking about here, uh, like if you're subscribed to this channel, I'm sure you're interested in the whole one person business model and like a personal branding or the creator economy because it's so new, but I feel like it's new for a reason, right? We've advanced to this point in society as to where everyone and their mother can have their own business, right? As a creator, as we are, as people, we are creators. And so as a creator, what do you do, right? You build a brand and you can learn the skills to solve the problems in your brand so you can actually grow it. And then usually in my case, and what I promote is being a value creator. So your job is to educate and entertain better than the schools can because they can't keep up with go what's going on. They can't cover every aspect of reality like everyone that is researching their own unique interests can. And so when you teach about those things and you synthesize what you're learning into an articulate uh, piece of educational material or content, then like it's just the best way to learn. I I've only come to experience this because I've done it, but I recommend other people do it so they can find this out. But the best way to retain what you learn in relation to the things you love learning about is to one, improve yourself in public with a personal brand, learn the skills necessary to build that so you remember those skills, and then you can teach about those skills or just your interests so you retain a lot of that knowledge and slowly and slowly over time with a personal brand, it's dynamic, right? You're not limited to one specific niche because it's under your name. And so you can dive into all of these different domains as long as you're making your interests interesting to other people. And then you can grow, you can build an audience, and then eventually you can create a product to monetize. And by this point, if you stick it out long enough and actually do what I'm telling you to do here, then like that's how you make a living for yourself. So the last step, step number six is to turn this into your life's work. The amount of serendipity that will occur in your life, your luck surface area is directly proportional to the degree to which you do something you're passionate about combined with the total number of people to who this is effectively communicated. Jason Roberts. That is a fucking great quote. Work is a necessary part of life. And for most work consumes a majority of their waking hours. And for many, this work lacks interest and passion. And so if it lacks interest and passion and work consumes a large amount of your waking hours, then a large amount of your waking hours are spent doing something that you have no interest or passion in. And is this, is this something that you want, right? Because uh, with time and because of polarity, right? There, there's work and there's rest. One doesn't exist without the other. If you go too much rest, or you only think that you want to rest the entire life, your entire life, you're, you're not going to like it because there's no, there's no balance there. There's no wave. The rest loses meaning if work ceases to exist. And if rest ceases to exist, then work lacks meaning. And so I personally, maybe my views on this will change, but I don't ever plan on retiring because even if I do retire per se, I'm still probably going to work on something, right? I'm still going to build something. And so since work and rest are a must in every single person's life, do you want the work aspect to be something that you lack interest or enjoyment in? If not, here's what I would do. Research what you feel pulled to research. Don't get distracted. Let it pull you deep into a rabbit hole of discovery. Understand that sustained curiosity plus excitement equals passion. Practice sustaining that passion with everything we've talked about here 
note down your findings, build a project and begin teaching others. And so since I do talk about this a lot under the lens of the one person business or being a value creator, what many people don't realize is that products start off as projects. So if you are the project and you put that project on the public market, social media, you become a product that other people want to invest in with not only their money, but their attention. Projectize yourself, then productize yourself. Now, you have to understand that you don't launch a product when it's perfect. That's impossible. Entrepreneurs or just business people in general, they launch MVPs or minimum viable products. What that is, is it's a project that delivers enough value to charge for, launch, and build or improve over time. So to summarize everything, you are your life's work. Your minimum viable product was created at birth. Start, build, teach, and have an absolutely incredible rest of your week, my friends. But before we go, uh, please do not forget to like, subscribe, check out the products that I have in the description to our writer. That's the course I recommend people start with if you want to invest in a good skill. Then there's Modern Mastery, the community. Uh, viewers or subscribers or however you want to label yourselves can join for five bucks. It's community has a business strategy library and a bunch of other stuff in there. And then just check out links in the description, see what you like and have a good rest of your day. Peace.